Who still has Christmas decorations up? In Lion Church. Who had the tree out on the curb the afternoon of the 26th? I live in Manchester, so I'm always amused to drive around the next day and see them all sitting out in the snow. Like Makes me sad. The baptism of the Lord, as Father mentioned, is the official close of the Christmas season. And very interesting because in that sequence in Scripture, baptism of the Lord presents us the beginning of Christ's public ministry. Remember, he is baptized in the Jordan, and he goes out into the desert to be tempted by the evil one. And then he moves into his public ministry after that. John was preaching a baptism of repentance. So it really begs the question, as Father mentioned in his homily today, why would Jesus, who is without sin, be willing to submit to the baptism of repentance by John? And it's a very good question. It's a very interesting question. Remember that sin is an act of the will. It's a choice each and every single one of us make. Christ possesses the divine will, the will of God. So therefore, it's impossible for him to sin. It would be the ultimate in contradiction. So why then submit to the baptism of John? Well, as Father mentioned, there's a solidarity there. Remember that in the Incarnation, God took on human flesh. And even though he did not sin, all the pain, the anxiety, the worry, the sadness, the complications, everything that's involved in being human, our Lord took that on, and he brought it all to the waters of the Jordan, and forever sanctifying those waters being the sanctifying grace of baptism to the water and making it a sacrament. In the Old Testament, there's a lot of pre-configurations of baptism. And we know many of the big ones. The flood at the time of Noah that washed away the sinfulness of the world. God parting the Red Sea at the time of Moses to lead the chosen people out of the bondage and slavery of Egypt. But there's one that sometimes we forget that I think is very pertinent to the baptism of our Lord in the Jordan. You'll remember that the Israelites wandered around in the desert, and they weren't necessarily wandering around because they were lost. The Lord was letting them wander around because of their sinfulness. They weren't ready to inherit the promised land. And so much was that sinfulness that even Moses himself was not allowed to see, to enter the promised land. It was his successor, Joshua, that led the people to the promised land. And in Joshua, chapter 3, we read the Israelites come up to the promised land. And they're looking into the promised land, but there's a barrier there. There's something in the way. And what is in the way is the River Jordan. And as Scripture tells us, at that time, the Jordan was overflowed, and there was no way that they could pass it. And so what happened? The Lord God said, the priests were to take up the Ark of the Covenant, and they were to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the waters of the Jordan. And as their feet touched the water, upriver, the water stopped. And eventually, just like the Red Sea, the Israelites passed across the Jordan River on dry land because the Ark of the Covenant stood in the middle of the river. Why is that significant? The wandering in sinfulness and the wandering in the desert and the great promises of God, the promised land, life with Him, that barrier there can be bridged through baptism, through the sanctifying grace that we receive in our baptism. And what that story in Joshua shows us is that God entered in first, just like our Lord submitted to John in the Jordan to be baptized, to forever make it holy for each and every one of us. Amen?